Thank you, Julian. Hello, Lucid. Um, it's great to be back. And um, another hand for Julian, who does a great job putting this together. It takes a lot of work to put this together, so thank you for doing what you're doing. Um, so money, I, I, am, um, I started working on Wall Street uh, just months before the credit crisis began in, uh, in 2008, and um, I was really shocked uh, with the devastation that it caused. First on Wall Street, people losing their jobs, but also across Main Street, people losing their houses, and also through the, throughout the emerging world. And I focus on, I do emerging, or I did emerging market investments at a global investment bank. So I ask the question, what's going on in your mind? What's going on in your brain when you think about money? Because you know, people act so irrationally when they spend it, when they, when they trade it, when they invest it. And so I got into this field uh, called neuroeconomics, basically neuroscientists that look at what's going on in the brain. And um, you know, they've done brain scans of people who, um, they, they compare brain scans of people who are about to make money and then they compare those brain scans to people who are high on cocaine. And they're the same, virtually the same. <clears throat> In fact, we just had a talk on sex. Think about this. They have a, they, they showed, um, another, in another study, they took people, heterosexual men, showed them the pictures of dead bodies, naked women, and money. And what got the most neural activation? It was money. Yeah. By, by a magna of ortitude. That I don't know. I have to look into that. I didn't write that book, but um, so you start looking at man. You know when I when I even when I say the word money to you and, and offer you potential of making money, it, your skin conductance increases. There's a physiological change, an electrical current that's going through your skin, right? When people when you touch money, when you touch money and you you know count money and you put your money. This is another study. Put your put your hand in um, hot scalding water. You, the people who did this reported feeling. Uh, they were numb to the pain, right? There's a physiological change of what's happening when you deal with money. So I looked, looked at this topic for over four years. Um, I traveled to over 25 countries uh, looking at what is this idea of money. And I structured the book into three sections. I want to tell you three stories, um, mind, body, and soul, right? So the, for, for mind, the idea of money, money is not just an object, it's an, it's an idea. And so those of you who have taken economics, um, economics courses begin like this. Once upon a time, you know, land far away, um, people began bartering with each other, right? So you have something, someone else has something else, and you do the trade. But what happens when you don't want what they have? Well, there's bartering, and then that's where money comes in. And money, starts to, money starts to replace bartering. Aristotle said this, Adam Smith says this, but the anthropologists come back and say, well, wait, wait a second, there's never been a society in the history of the world that's ever existed which is a pretty emphatic statement, where um, bartering was the principal currency. In fact, there's another currency that's more, is, is the most ancient type of currency, which is debt, right, which is debt. And so I looked at this idea of debt all around the world. And in particular, I was in Japan not too long ago, and I w was shopping, I was going to a, to a friend's place, and I picked up some really delicious grapes. Went to the department store, those of you who've been, been to Japan, really, really good fruit, right? They kind of like, customize it and they, they uh, genetically modify it. These grapes are $40, right? Really expensive grapes. And so I took them and I brought them to, uh, to my friends and almost no one would accept them. What was going on? I said, these are some delicious grapes. I just spent $40 on these grapes. And this, my friend said, you know, you're gonna be going back to New York in a couple days. We will never be able to repay you. The word arigato in Japanese loosely translates to this difficult thing. There's a more complicated, a more, another term called sumisian, which means, I'm sorry, I cannot, cannot accept this. When you go to a Japanese department store, they will not let you wrap the presents. Because if you do a poor job, it will reflect poorly on them. Right? So you, whereas in here, you can do it yourself. In America, they want you to say, here's a wrapping paper, you do it yourself. Right? So when you go to a Japanese wedding, you have to tie the ribbon in a very precise manner when you give the present. Because if you tie it too loosely, you're gonna get the implication that you don't think the, wedding's, the marriage is gonna last, right? So there's this whole idea of gift giving, and we think about it today, like I owe you one, the favor bank, like who owes me? And so this whole idea of reciprocity and um, debt is so central to who we are. There's one Wall Street uh, banker, CEO, in his breast pocket, he keeps a piece of paper, and um, on one side it's people who owe him, and then on the other side, people who 
he owes, right? And so in that way, the gift economy, this idea of debt is a principal currency. No, money is not just some kind of piece of paper, it's who do you owe? And we can, there's evolutionary reasons to this. I get into that in the book. But I wanted to talk, that's, that's sort of the idea of money. Start thinking of money as a measurement of debt, of who owes who. And there's, no matter what country you go to, people have different ideas of what that means. Now, body. Um, so in my body section, I look at what is money, like physically. Julian was just talking about a piece of paper, right? Where does that come from? And so I wanted to, to find sort of the roots of this. So the measure of paper money happens 900 AD in China. But I thought the more intriguing part was, um, was in the 13th century Mongolia. So I went to Mongolia. I took the first plane out of here and went to Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. And I drove from Ulaanbaatar eight hours to Karakoram, Mongolia, right? And what did I find? This is the seat of the ancient Mongol Empire, right? And the Mongols are very nomadic people. There were a few yurts and everything. And I went there, there was, there was almost nothing there almost nothing there, but this was the seat of the, of the ancient empire. And back in the day, in the, 12th, in the, in the 13th century, the, in Karakoram, they created paper money. And they used this paper money uh, because um, they were trying to entice merchants to come along the Silk Route into the Mongol steppes. And so we we're gonna back our paper money with silver, with silk, and they started distributing this, this currency around the world. And it had great success. I mean, the Mongols were able to conquer it was the largest empire in the world, right? They were able to conquer these places, not just by their bows and arrows, but by the paper, because this paper started circling, circulating all throughout, the, uh, all throughout their kingdom. And so what happens is when Kublai Khan comes to power, right, he comes to power in the 13th century, he makes a vital mistake. He um, goes and he conquers the Southern Song dynasty. He adds 60 million people to his empire. And he says, well, we have all these people, but we ran out of money. So he starts to create money, he starts to take the money and say, you know what, money's no longer gonna be backed by silver or silk, it's gonna be backed by me. And if you don't accept it, I will kill you, right? <laughs> so counterfeiters were put to death, uh, and there was, you know, there was um, people who doubted the currency, you know? Now, they didn't wanna trade in it, but he enforced it. You know, Marco Polo, in the, in the, tra in the uh, travels of Marco Polo, he says, you know, the great Khan makes money out of the barks of trees, out of the barks of trees. So what ends up happening is, as you guessed it probably, spending gets out of control. And because they keep on printing, printing more money, there's a lot of inflation, um, and then a lot of, there's an economic crisis, and this happens over and over and over again. The lessons from the Mongol Empire. So, you know, going to the, Mon to the to Karakoram is barely a glimmer of what it represented. But I went there to, to kind of highlight that paper money can fuel the rise of a great empire, and you can administer, the policy, administer policy through great lands, and also it can spell its demise. So I go through the forms of money throughout the book. And then lastly, the soul of money. What, is this, what, do, what do I mean by that? And so I went to Calcutta, India, and um, I went to Mother Teresa's Home for the Dying and Destitute in Calcutta. And this is really where people come uh, from the streets, they're gathered up, and they go there to die, all right? And I walked in, and there were, I was just surrounded by lepers. And um, there was a, a young teenager there um, from France, and he was so vibrant and very, he was smiling and chirping, and um, his, his visage actually was a great contrast to everyone else. And afterwards, he, you know, he was putting the food in the lepers' mouths, and I said, you know, why are you here, man? Like, you, <laughs> why? And he said, you know, I, I'm doing as, as the Gospels teach. I'm doing as the Gospels teach. And um, he said, my, I, I was raised a Catholic. And um, he said, you know, Kabir, though everyone here is poor, they're rich in spirit, right? And from there, I started to go back and look at, wow, the New Testament, right? 80% of, of the parables that Jesus says in the book of Matthew are about money or wealth or something to do with it, right? You go to the Quran, 83 verses about wealth in the Quran. Judaism is just replete with, with passages about what to do with money, who to give um, uh, money to in terms of charity. Hinduism, replete with it. And so I started thinking about, wow, every spiritual tradition, there's a lot, a lot, I mean, how we determine, how we use money can determine the fate of our souls, right? And so when Jesus says, lay up treasures in heaven but not on earth, 
Um, that's something very powerful because every, I mean, I've worked on Wall Street. There's a logic on Wall Street that we all use, not just on Wall Street, all of us, which is more is better, more, 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 right? An economic, a, a genetic logic, an evolutionary logic, more is more, more is more, more is better. But across the spiritual faiths, there's a philosophy which is less is more, right? And so in Hinduism, I find a very powerful concept, which is called, in Hinduism, there's four concepts, of four goals of life. The first, there's only two that really matter to this conversation. One of them is called artha. Like, you're supposed to go out and make money. That's like one of the callings of life. Because you have to take care of your family. You have to take care of your, of your kids. But there will come a time that this pursuit of money will leave you hollow and looking for something more. And that will lead you to the end goal, which is called moksha, which is liberation, to liberate from it. And this can correspond to periods of your life. So when you're early in life, you're supposed to be making money and accumulating wealth and taking care of your family. But there will come a time later in life, maybe, when you depart this world where you should renounce it, right? This can also correspond to moments of the day. People in, in India live like this. In the morning, they go to work. In the evening, there's more spiritual calling, and they, um, and they try to live in a way that's, that's more detached from money. So the book is, um, it came out just yesterday, and um, I, look, I look at all these ideas, I, I, and uh, I go to the Galapagos, and I look at, at um, evolutionary biology and um, behavioral economics and finance, but money really shapes our minds, it steers our bodies, and it can really determine the fate of our souls. So I hope you check out this book. It's only 250 pages. Um, uh, 35 pages of footnotes. I really spent, it was really a passion of mine to do this. And I didn't see Julian for a couple of years because of this. And um, it's a great pleasure to be able to share, um, share, this, share this work with you. Thank you for having me. Really shocked uh, with the devastation that it caused. First on Wall Street, people losing their jobs, but also across Main Street, people losing their houses, and also through the, throughout the emerging world. And I focus on, I do emerging, or I did emerging market investments at a global investment bank. It takes a lot of work to put this together, so thank you for doing what you're doing. Um, so money, I, I, am, um, I started working on Wall Street uh, just months before the credit crisis began in, uh, in 2008, and um, I was... Thank you, Julian. Hello, Lucid. Um, it's great to be back. And um, another hand for Julian, who does a great job putting this together, uh, called neuroeconomics. Basically, neuroscientists that look at what's going on in the brain. And um, you know, they've done brain scans of people who, um, they, they compare brain scans of people who are about to make money. So I asked the question, what's going on in your mind? What's going on in your brain when you think about money? Because you know, people act so irrationally when they spend it, when they, when they trade it, when they invest it. And so I got into this field 